of 105,000 men to the destruction total de la Prusse. She promised never to make peace with Prussia until Silesia had been restored to Austria. When that restoration had been consummated, France was to receive five frontier towns in the Austrian Netherlands. The southern Netherlands were to be transferred to the Bourbon Infante of Spain, returned for Spanish duchies in Italy. Perhaps France was knowingly writing off her colonies to British conquest by devoting nearly all her resources to absorbing Belgium. Downitz could feel that he had won a vital diplomatic victory. He found it easy now to draw Russia into active aid. The Convention of St. Petersburg on February 2nd, 1757, committed Russia and Austria each to put 80,000 troops into the field to make war until Silesia had been reunited with Austria and Russia had been reduced to a minor power. Turning to Sweden, Kaunitz brought her into the alliance by guaranteeing to her, in the event of victory, all that part of Pomerania which had been conceded to her in the Treaty of Westphalia. Sweden was to contribute 25,000 men, Austria and France were to finance them. Poland, under its refugee king Augustus III, pledged her modest resources to the Franco-Austrian alliance. Now, nearly all of Europe except England, Hanover, Denmark, Holland, Switzerland, Turkey, and Hesse Castle was united against Frederick. And England was tempted to leave Frederick to his fate. George II saw with horror that his beloved Hanover, the electorate from which his father had come to rule Britain, lay defenseless in the path of overwhelming armies, with Frederick too distant and harassed to send substantial aid. The temptation was made almost irresistible when Kaunitz offered to leave Hanover inviolate if England would keep out of the Continental War. At that moment, Frederick's fate was touch and go. Pitt, who was appointed Secretary of State on November 19, 1756, was at first inclined to let Prussia and Hanover ship for themselves, while England would concentrate all her martial resources upon the contest for colonies. Little wonder that George II, loving Hanover, hated Pitt. Soon, Pitt changed his mind and declared that a France victorious against Frederick would be master of Europe. Soon of England, too. Parliament must vote money for Frederick and troops for Hanover. France must be made to spend herself in Europe, while England would pluck colonies and markets out of the conquered sea. So in January 1757, Britain signed a second alliance with Prussia, promising subsidies to Frederick and soldiers to Hanover. Then suddenly Pitt was dismissed on April 5th. Politics befuddled policy, help to Frederick was delayed. For almost a year he stood alone with 145,000 men against armies converging from every quarter upon him. In the west, 105,000 troops from France and 20,000 from the German states. In the south, 133,000 from Austria. In the east, 60,000 from Russia. In the north, 16,000 from Sweden. And on that same day which saw Pitt fall, the Emperor Francis I, the usually amiable and docile husband of Maria Theresa, officially branded Frederick as an outlaw and called upon all good men to hunt him out as an impious enemy of mankind. 3. From Prague to Rosbach, 1757. On January 10th, Frederick sent to his ministers in Berlin some secret instructions. If I am killed, affairs must continue without the slightest alteration. If I have the bad luck to be captured, I forbid the smallest consideration for my person or the slightest attention to anything I may write in captivity. It was a useless gesture, for without his military genius, Russia was lost. His only hope lay in facing his foes one at a time before they could unite. The French were not yet ready for battle, and perhaps the regiments that England was sending to Hanover could hold them for a while. The Austrians were accumulating in nearby Bohemia and Moravia immense magazines of arms and provisions to equip their armies for an invasion of Silesia. Frederick decided first to capture those precious stores, fight the Austrians, then march back to face the French. He led his own force from Saxony and ordered the Duke of brunswick bevern from East Germany and Marshal Schwerin from Silesia to advance into Bohemia and meet him in the hills overlooking Prague from the west. It was so done, magazines were captured, and on May 6th, near Prague, 64,000 Prussians met 61,000 Austrians under Prince Charles of Lorraine in the first great battle of the war. The issue was decided not by numbers, nor by strategy, but by courage. 
Schwerin's regiments under Austrian fire marched waist deep, shoulder deep through morasses. For a time they lost heart and turned in flight. Then Schwerin, aged 73, rallied them, wrapped the colors about his body, rode straight in the face of the foe, was struck by five balls at once and fell dead. His men, loving him almost more than they feared death, charged in fury against the enemy and turned defeat into victory. The slaughter on both sides was enormous. Frederick's losses included 400 officers and his best general. In this war, generals did not die in bed. The 46,000 surviving Austrians retired into their citadel in Prague and prepared to resist siege. But Frederick found siege difficult, for Marshal Leopold von Daun, ablest of the Austrian commanders, was coming up from Moravia with another 64,000 men. Leaving part of his army to blockade the citadel, Frederick marched eastward with 32,000 troops and met the advancing masses at Kolin, June 16. The odds against him were too great and the generalship of Down was in this case superior to his own. Two of Frederick's generals disobeyed his orders, causing confusion. Frederick lost his temper and shouted to his retreating cavalry, Would you live forever? The infantry, overwhelmed by carnage, refused to advance. Frederick, despondent, withdrew from the field, leaving 14,000 Prussians dead, wounded, or prisoners. He led his 18,000 survivors back to Prague, abandoned the siege, and returned with his remnants towards Saxony. At Light Merritt, he rested his army for three weeks. There, on July 2nd, he received word that his mother, Sophia Dorothea, had died. The Iron Man of War broke down, wept, and secluded himself for a day. Perhaps he wondered now whether his assault on Silesia, 17 years before, had been a foolish tempting of Nemesis. He shared his grief with his sister, Wilhelmina, Margravina Bayreuth, he loved beyond any other soul. On July 7th, his pride nearly spent, he sent her a desperate appeal. Since you, my dear sister, insist upon undertaking the great work of peace, I beg you to be good enough to send Monsieur de Mirabeau to offer the favorite Madame de Pompadour, formerly Cotillon IV, as much as 500,000 crowns for peace. I leave it all to you, my adore, and who, although far more accomplished than myself, is another myself. Nothing came of this approach. Wilhelmina tried another way. She wrote to Voltaire, then living in Switzerland, and begged him to use his influence. Voltaire transmitted her proposal to Cardinal de Tansin, who opposed the Franco-Austrian alliance. Tansin tried and failed. The Allies were sniffing the scent of victory. Maria Theresa now talked of completely dismembering Frederick's realm. Not only must Silesia and Glatz be restored to her, but Magdeburg and Halberstadt were to go to Augustus III, Pomerania was to revert to Sweden, and Cleves and Ravensburg were to reward the Elector Palatine. Her hopes seemed reasonable. A French army of the Dauphine had entered Germany, part of it under Pompadour's favorite general. The France de Soubise was coming to join with the Imperial Army at Erfurt. Another part under Maréchal Destray advanced to meet a Hanoverian force under George II's son, the Duke of Cumberland. Near the village of Hastenbeck, the French so badly defeated this army on July 26th that the Duke signed at Klosterzeven September 8th, a convention by which he promised to keep his Hanoverian troops from any further action against France. Word of this humiliating capitulation may have reached Frederick at approximately the same time as news that a Swedish army had landed in Pomerania and the Russian army of 100,000 men under Marshal Stepan Apraxian had invaded East Prussia and overwhelmed a force of 30,000 Prussians at Grossjägerstuhl on July 30th. These reverses, adding to his own debacle in Bohemia, almost destroyed Frederick's hope of overcoming enemies so numerous and so fortified with reserves of materials and men. Having abandoned the morality as well as the theology of Christianity, he fell back upon the ethics of the Stoics and meditated suicide. To the end of the war, he carried on his person a vial of poison. It was resolved that his foes should never take him except as a corpse. On August 24th, he sent to Wilhelmina, semi-hysterical pian to death. And now, ye promoters of sacred lies, go on leading cowards by the nose. To me, the enchantment of life is ended, the charm disappears. I see that all men are but the sport of destiny. 
that if there do exist some gloomy and inexorable being who allows a despised herd of creatures to go on multiplying here, he values them as nothing.
down upon a valorous ground with the Socrates in chains, upon our virtues and our misdeeds, upon the horror of war and the cruel. the earth as things indifferent to him. Wherefore my sole refuge and only haven, dear sister, is in the arms of death. She answered on September 15th by vowing to join him in suicide. My dearest brother, your letter and the one you wrote to Voltaire have almost killed me. What fatal resolutions, great God. Ah, my dear brother, you say you love me and yet you drive a dagger into my heart. Your letter make me shed rivers of tears. Now I am ashamed of such weakness. Your lot shall be mine. I will not survive either your misfortunes or those of the house I belong to. You may calculate that such is my firm resolution. But after this avowal, let me entreat you to look back at what was the pitiable state of your enemy when you lay before Prague. It is the sudden whirl of fortune for both parties. Caesar was once the slave of pirates and became lord of the earth. A great genius like yours finds resources even when all seems lost. I suffer a thousand times more than I can tell you. Nevertheless, hope does not abandon me. I must finish, but I shall never cease to be. With the most profound respect, your Wilhelmina. She appealed to Voltaire to support her plea, and early in October, in his first letter to Frederick since 1753, he seconded her argument. Cato's and Otho's, whose death your majesty thinks noble, had nothing else they could do but fight or die. You must keep in mind how many courts there are that see in your invasion of Saxony a vibe. Europe are never long on the same basis, and it is the duty of a man like you to 